But I just want to get a thought planted in your mind here at the start of the service today. If you've ever read biographies of famous people, um, maybe someone like Abraham Lincoln or Gandhi, uh, Martin Luther King, JFK, uh, their deaths, even at the point of uh, unusual deaths like Martin Luther King and JFK, uh, their deaths as a part of the biography make up actually a very small part of the story. There's one major exception to that in uh, the history as we look at it, and that's Jesus Christ. Shortly after his death, four biographies were written. And in those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, about 33% of the account of the biography are devoted to the death, the events surrounding the death of Jesus Christ. We're at that time of the year where that becomes very important. Uh, I know many churches observe this time of year with uh, the full Lenten experience, where Lent is a period that is officially, formally observed. Uh, other churches uh, try to make sure that Easter Sunday is going to be a very, very special Sunday. Uh, this year, we're doing something where we're looking at four days as we approach Easter over these next four Sundays. Four defining days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They're part of what's uh, commonly called the Holy Week. Uh, we're going to be looking at those days. We're going to look at Friday today. Next week, we're going to back up and look at Thursday. And then we'll move ahead and look at Saturday on that next uh, week, Palm Sunday. Good Friday will be devoted to Good Friday. And then finally, on Easter Sunday, we'll look at that great climatic day that is Easter Sunday. Today, we start with Friday. It's Friday. Times are not exact, because in the Bible, times were not often determined exactly when you're reading. We're going to start today at the end of the day, with Jesus no longer even hanging on the cross. Two thieves still there. Jesus has been taken down, and the, the world is kind of reeling with the events that's taken place that day. Over that middle cross, there is a sign. The sign reads, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It's written in Aramaic. It's written in Greek. It's written in Latin. We'll come back to that later. There, there are some questions that are also hanging over that scene. How did we get here? Why did this man, Jesus, die? How did this meek, mild, blesser of children, friend of sinners end up being executed as an enemy of the state. And so as we walk through this over these next few weeks, we're going to see some powerful forces at work here. Those forces end up thinking that they've crushed Jesus. But when we keep on trying to understand, it becomes clear that the people, the people who thought they were in charge that day, they really weren't. Everyone had an agenda on that Friday. We're going to look at those major players this morning briefly and ask, what did they want? whose agenda prevailed, whose will triumphed, why did Jesus die? All right, then, we are looking at four defining days here over these next four Sundays. And we're going to jump into this uh, on that day, Friday, and we're going to look at uh, some of the major players that were involved on that day. My, my goal here is uh, these events that surround Easter, they're so familiar to us. Uh, there are many people where... Uh, they go to church and they think the only two topics that are talked about in church are Christmas and Easter, because those are the days that they're in church. So in the, in the process of uh, looking at this, just to be able to have a deeper appreciation and to be able to have our, our love, our gratitude for uh, what Jesus did for us, I, I know last night uh, as the choir sang, I was hearing the name of Christ uh, just in, glorified in what they did. We were out eating last night. I heard the name of Jesus being used by some place in the restaurant in a way that was not uh, real glorifying. Uh, to be able, it, it's like a knife gets plunged into your heart when you hear the name of Jesus used in that way uh, to be able to uh, make a point or express disappointment. So among our major players, uh, one of the primary major players, of course, was Rome. Rome would say Jesus died because Jesus was a threat, 
and any threat to Rome had to die. Now, why was Jesus a threat? Well, he's called Jesus Christ. In our day, people sometimes mistakenly think that Christ is like his, his last name. It's not. The word Christ comes from the Greek word krio. It means to anoint. It means the anointed one or the Messiah, someone who is set apart. And the concept of Messiah, it is fundamental to being able to understand Jesus, who he was, what he did, and why he did it. In his day, you need to understand there were many others who claimed to be a Messiah. Uh, there were people there who thought they were going to be able to lead a political revolt. Now try to imagine the Middle East, the Middle East as a volatile place where religious fervor and politics somehow get mixed together in dangerous ways. It's kind of a hard thing to imagine that coming out of the Middle East, isn't it? What's true today was even more so in Jesus' day as Rome had introduced itself as that conqueror who had a high iron fist and controlled everyone. There were also the crowds in Jerusalem. Another major factor in the story, the crowds who were there to participate in the Jewish feast of Passover. Uh, these were people that they're chafing under Roman occupation. They are waiting for a leader who's going to lead them in overthrowing Rome. They dream of Israel being freed so it can return to the place that they saw in the Old Testament that God intended for them to be as the dream of the world, the envy of the nation. And as a result, there were several wannabe messiahs in Jesus' day. There were different ideas about who this messiah would be, but everyone agreed on one thing. The messiah would be a powerful figure who would overthrow Rome and lead Israel forward in freedom. And they all understood that would be the case with anyone who would be called messiah. There were the would-be messiahs as well. We read about some of these messiahs in the New Testament. In Acts 5, we read some time ago, Thutis appeared, claiming to be somebody. I love the way that's put. He, I'm somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him. And then Luke writes, he was killed. The Jewish historian Josephus also tells us about Thutis. He was actually called a messiah by Josephus. He recruited some followers. He claimed that uh, he could part the Jordan River. He predicted that he would make the walls of Jerusalem fall down in a Jericho-like Joshua kind of display of power. He led a revolt against Rome. And then they captured him and they decapitated him in Jerusalem where everyone could see what happens when you mess with Rome. As a result, Acts tells us all of his followers dispersed and this great movement came to nothing. Another would-be Messiah was Judas the Galilean. And that phrase is important, that he was the Galilean. Acts 5 says, After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all his followers were scattered. Well, not quite all of them were scattered, according to Josephus. He tells us about Judas' followers. They were called zealots. Uh, Judas said, God alone is the God of Israel. Caesar is an idol, a false idol. And therefore, Israel should never pay taxes to Rome. That got him some popular votes. People liked that idea a lot. Rome didn't like it so much. One of Jesus' disciples was Simon the Zealot. If you remember, the Zealot agenda was to revolt, believing God would destroy Rome, deliver his people, and all would be well. And so Judas the Galilean led the revolt. Many people joined the cause. He was eventually captured by Rome along with hundreds of his followers. Josephus tells how Rome crucified 2,000 of them with crosses that lined the sides of the road where everyone could see how it ends for someone who opposes Rome. Now, just in case anyone thought it might be a good idea to not pay taxes, Rome had plenty of crosses still available to use. So April 15th is coming. I don't think there are any crosses involved. It may feel like that, but not necessarily. It happens that all of these events, because they took place in Galilee, when Jesus was a boy growing up, Jesus very likely would have seen those crosses along the road saying, here's what happens to anyone who claims to be Messiah. That brings us to a really big question. 
Because being Messiah, kind of a dangerous proposition. How do you know if you're truly the Messiah? Something like the story of King Arthur. He had a good name, didn't he? The legend said that there was a sword in the stone, and any person who could pull the sword out of the stone would become king. Arthur was the only one who could do it. Well, actually, he was the first one who did it, and the only one who did it. He became the legendary king of the round table. How do you know if you're Messiah? Wisdom said that the guy who could defeat Rome, that was the Messiah. The only problem was you would never know until you tried. And so they tried with the prospect of being crucified if they tried and failed. History tells us there were at least 18 who tried. They would recruit their merry band of followers to attack Roman soldiers. They saw themselves kind of like a Robin Hood uh, attacking Rome, taking back what rightfully belonged to them. All 18 tried and failed. And Rome regarded them as thieves. The Greek word used for some of them is lestes. If you go back to those two outer crosses on Golgotha, where thieves are being executed. Now, why would they execute? Why would they crucify a thief? It seems kind of harsh for a, a thief. Now, these weren't common thieves. They're not there because they'd been shoplifting at Walmart and refused to cooperate with security. These were part of the anti-Roman revolts that were taking place. And so Rome was sending a message to the crowds who witnessed those executions again, don't mess with Rome. And so on Friday, Jesus is crucified, even though he never identified himself as one of those military-like, anti-Rome, leader-type messiahs. In fact, the New Testament tells us that he rejected those attempts when the crowd tried to make him into that. If you remember, after Jesus had miraculously fed the crowds of people with a couple of fish, a few loaves of bread, the crowd comes and they try to make him king by force because they want a Messiah who is going to take Rome down, and he refuses to be part of that. He withdraws into the hills. He's there by himself, and the people are really frustrated because unlike other wannabe messiahs, Jesus refuses to be swept up into that frenzy of let's get Rome, let's revolt. So those were the would-be messiahs when Jesus came onto the scene. And then we have the characters that we normally focus on during the Easter accounts. There's Pontius Pilate, chief priests, Pharisees, and then there are also the zealots in the scenes. If you go back to an earlier scene on Friday, we've started with Jesus uh, no longer on the cross, the thieves left there. If you go back a little earlier on that Friday... The Jewish priests bring Jesus before a man who's forever vilified as Pontius Pilate. Uh, Not many positive vibes are connected with that name. Pilate rules Judea for Caesar. His official title is procurator. He's stationed in Rome for the purpose of overseeing the area and procuring the taxes. Now, Pilate is an ambitious man. No one in his position wants to end up stationed in Jerusalem. It was viewed as kind of a career-ending kind of place to be assigned. The chief priests, they're in charge of the temple. They, They have a very narrow line they're trying to walk during all of these events. They have to stay close enough to Rome. They have to cozy up to Rome enough so that they're not going to be removed from their positions. But they can't be so closely identified with Rome that the people won't follow. And so the best word to describe how they're trying to work is collaboration or cooperation. They willingly cooperate with the enemy to protect their position for their own good. Uh, Next, you see the Pharisees. They're the experts at teaching the Jewish law. The best way to describe their strategy is purification. They believed Israel's problems are rooted in neglect of the Torah, uh, the books that Moses wrote, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Numbers and Deuteronomy. If they can get the people to obey Torah and to purify themselves according to the law of Moses, they think God's going to honor that kind of devotion and will liberate them then by coming and destroying Rome. There's another group called the Zealots. We've seen them a little bit already. These groups all have the goal. They're going to overthrow different strategies to do that. But at all of them, they're there to fight evil Rome. 
They needed to be courageous. They needed to take up weapons. They needed to attack. And if they would do that, they believed God would bless their efforts and Rome would be defeated. Finally, that last group, the Essenes, their strategy was just to withdraw from everything. Uh, They're kind of like the uh, fundamental right. Uh, Most of us are familiar with the Dead Sea Scrolls. They'd been hidden in caves by these people who had withdrawn because it wasn't just the Romans who were bad. They considered the temple system to be bad. It had been corrupted. The collaboration had watered it down, and so they wouldn't even go to the temple. And so they started their own community of people. They were going to get it right. And when they got it right, then God would finally wipe everyone else and start all over with just them. All of these opposition groups believed Rome was evil, needed to be destroyed. Now, they didn't get along with each other necessarily, necessarily, but they had a common enemy that they were all allied against. And now you come to Pilate's job. Pilate's job is to try to keep a lid on on this mess, to keep it from boiling over. And to do so, he often had to resort to ruthless methods. At one point, Pilate killed some Galileans while they were worshiping in the temple, and then he mixed their blood with the blood of the sacrificial animals. Uh, We see that referred to in Luke 13, when some people ask Jesus what he thinks about that action. The temple is a holy place. It's the core of Israel's identity. And Pilate has violated it because he saw what was taking place there in the holiest place at the holiest moment as a threat. And so they want to know, what does Jesus think? It was a moment when Jesus could have launched an uprising and thousands and thousands of people would have followed. But he didn't do it. Historians record another time when Pilate steals money from the temple so he can build an aqueduct in honor of Caesar. Uh, The Jews are furious. They protest. What does Pilate do? He has the protesters executed. Another time after Jesus, Pilate slaughtered so many people near Samaria and there was so much unrest that word gets back to Caesar Caesar then essentially fires Pilate and recalls him to Rome, and that's the last we ever hear of him. The historian Philo records that Pilate's rule, here's what he says, it was marked by bribery, insults, robberies, supreme addictive temper, and executions without a trial. And this is the man who now holds the fate of Jesus in his hands when the chief priest brings Jesus to him. So we begin to understand Friday in a whole new way when they announce the charges against Jesus before Pilate. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. Now, Jesus should have been a hero if he really was leading a tax revolt against Rome. The chief priest didn't want to be paying taxes to Rome, but it's more important to them to make the case against Jesus, even if the charge isn't true. And they know that this charge is going to get Pilate's attention because they paint Jesus as a problem for Rome. And because Caesar would never like Jesus, they pressure Pilate to do something about Jesus. And Pilate resists. Now, he doesn't resist out of sympathy for Jesus. You need to understand that. He resists because he always resists the chief priests. He knows that their agenda is never favorable for him, so he doesn't want to do what they suggest because that's going to make them stronger, and if they're stronger, he's weaker. And so he looks for any reason to resist them. And so when he learns that Jesus is from Galilee, he's found his way out. Herod has jurisdiction over Galilee, and so Pilate sends Jesus to Herod. 
But Herod doesn't want to have anything to do with Jesus either, and so he sends him back to Pilate. And at that point, Pilate appeals to the crowd, as was customary at Passover, to see which prisoner they would rather have him release. Do they want Jesus, the teacher, the blesser of children, the miracle worker, or Barabbas, the murderer? And they shout for Barabbas to be released. He will at least be willing to kill some Romans, which is why he's being held for trial. And so finally, in a very famous scene, Pilate washes his hands. Now, this is often misunderstood. It's not that Pilate is sensitive to Jesus' innocence or thinks Jesus doesn't deserve to die. He really doesn't care about the fate of another would-be Messiah. He's killed several of them already, and one more isn't really going to matter to him. His agenda is to maintain the upper hand over the chief priest. But they have a trump card that they've been waiting to play. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And so then when Pilate asked if they want him to crucify their king, they speak horrible, tragic words that show just how far they're willing to go in this high-stakes political power game when they pronounce we have no king but Caesar it's a political contest in which each side keeps pointing to what Caesar wants have you ever asked what did Caesar want what does Caesar want history tells us Caesar wants corn he has an empire with people who need to eat They want to eat. And as the empire expanded, they became increasingly dependent on grain from Egypt. Grain was to the Middle East then what oil is today. And Caesar needs that grain, and so he wants someone who will keep everyone in check, especially in that place there along the Mediterranean Sea where the main highway goes through so that those grain shipments won't be interrupted. So why did Jesus die? One could say Jesus died for corn. He died so Caesar could keep the empire fed and contented. Caesar may never even have heard of Jesus. But Jesus died because Pilate couldn't risk having Caesar think he was too weak to have these anti-Rome sympathizers running amok. They had to be kept in check. And so Pilate turns to Jesus and he asks, Are you... The king of the Jews? It's a dramatic moment. If Jesus says the right thing, he could be set free. Now there's an irony in all of this. Earlier in his ministry, people wondered about this over and over. All Jesus had to do one time was to say, I am the Messiah. A big portion of the people would have joined him, willing to die. On the previous Sunday, Palm Sunday, with Jerusalem filled with people, the opportunity was there. They were celebrating the occasion when Moses had stood up against Pharaoh and God had delivered the people and set them free from their long enslavement in Egypt. The times, the names have changed. The scenario is the same. Israel is in bondage to Rome. The bad guy is now Caesar. The young dynamic teacher from Galilee named Jesus comes riding in on a donkey as the people celebrate, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. David, the warrior king who led the people to victory over their enemies, but Jesus won't fight. He never claims the title of Messiah while there in Jerusalem. Now he did in Samaria while he was sitting at a well with a woman who needed to hear the good news, but never in Judea. If he claimed the title, the crowd would have joined him. Instead, they turned against him in just a few days because Jesus wouldn't take up the sword and revolt. And so now, when it's too late to save himself when there's no one else around, when there's no chance of an army of people rising up to join him, Jesus finally gives a definitive answer to Pilate. When there's no chance that he's going to be viewed as a military leader, Jesus finally says, yes, it is as you say. 
Jesus knows what will happen. Pilate may not want it to happen, but eventually he washes his hands of the entire matter and pronounces the only sentence he can, Jesus must die. And so we come back to that question, who is really going to make this happen? To find the answer, we have to back up even further and ask another question. Why do the chief priests want Jesus dead? Something big had happened. Just before he made his celebrated entrance into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Do you remember that account? Jesus is now the topic of conversation. And the Pharisees and the chief priests have a meeting about what they need to do. Uh, we read there in John, the chief priest Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin, that's the Jewish ruling council. What are we accomplishing, they ask. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone's going to believe in him, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come. And what's the problem? They'll take away both our temple and our nation. There is a real possibility that could have happened. It did happen in 70 A.D., after one wannabe Messiah too many, the Romans finally came in. They destroyed the temple, essentially obliterated Israel and nation, until finally it was brought back in 1948. The religious leaders wanted to make sure their positions were retained. We can't lose our spots. And that's when the high priest Caiaphas spoke words that were filled with far more meaning than he ever comprehended. You don't realize that it's better for you that one man should die for the people than for the whole nation to be destroyed. That prophecy would come true in ways that exceeded what Caiaphas said. He never intended to say that Jesus would be the sacrifice, God's sacrifice for the world. He just saw that that sacrifice would maintain their positions because he knew if the unrest was too great, Rome was going to intervene, and that would be the end for them. Now, they knew Jesus wasn't a military threat. They understood Jesus represented something far different in ways that they'd never seen before. He was the living manifestation of the kingdom of God now on earth. The presence of God, the love of God, the power of God, the grace of God, the salvation of God were now on earth, but it wasn't found in the temple or in the sacrifices or in the keeping of the law. It was found in Jesus and how he lived and how he loved. And he was telling people that God's presence and blessing and forgiveness and guidance were now available to anyone through him. No one had ever said things like that or done things like he did. The Religious leaders simply could not allow that to continue, even though it was what they had been hoping for and longing for for centuries. Before the hearing with Pilate, there's another one with what's called the Sanhedrin, the Supreme Court of Israel. They arrested Jesus early on Friday, still dark. You know the story. They held their own trial, an illegal trial according to Jewish law. They wanted it done in secret so no one would know what was going on. They needed to handle this matter delicately, and they didn't want too many people to know what was happening because here was their agenda. They had to get the crowds to hate Jesus enough so that they could convince Rome through Pilate to crucify Jesus. And the best way to accomplish that is to convince Pilate that Jesus is a threat to Rome. And so to accomplish that, they came up with the two charges. He's telling people not to pay taxes, and he's claiming to be Messiah. They charge Jesus with blasphemy, so the crowds will hate him, and treason against Rome, so Pilate will deal with him. Now, you, you know the trial didn't go very well. They couldn't find evidence. They brought in the people to, they couldn't even get them to lie to get enough evidence. Uh, they may, he makes no effort to defend himself. He even sits silent as they mock him. When they ask him the question, are you the king of the Jews? He finally answers by saying, I am. And it's like time stopped right then. I am. And then he said, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming, coming on the clouds of heaven. This great messianic prediction. And when he says this, he pronounces his own death sentence. Jesus gives them what they need for their verdict. He does what they couldn't do. He does his work for them. 
Why would Jesus do that? We need to back up one last time. Go back to a time before the cross, before the meeting with Pilate, before the trial, before the Sanhedrin. It's about 2 a.m. We find ourselves in the Garden of Gethsemane. The story of the human race begins in a garden with the first Adam. The story of the second Adam, a title for Jesus in the New Testament, is going to end in a garden. In the garden, Jesus has many options. He can fight like the zealots. He's young. He has charisma. But we, people will follow him. Oh, they'll follow. He could withdraw like the scenes. He could go into the desert and start a small safe commune there in the desert. He could have chosen to collaborate with the chief priests. He had such popularity, they would have welcomed him in. They would have given him a place in the temple to teach. He could have tried to cut a deal with Pilate and to do what's acceptable to Rome. He could have even appealed to God the Father to rescue him. Jesus does none of those things. On this night, in the garden, early on Friday morning, this one lone, vulnerable man says, I know what I must do. I won't run. I won't fight. I won't deal. I won't dazzle. I'll die. I will die. Not my will, Father, but yours be done. And it's unbelievable. If anyone believed the real messianic mission was to die out of love for others, it's never been done before. Jesus knows rebels die for a cause, but his cause is far different as he chooses to die on a cross in place of rebels like Barabbas. Jesus knows the crowds are waiting for the word from him. They will go and they will kill a bunch of Roman soldiers. Jesus never gives that word. He goes to the cross and he dies. And a whole bunch of Roman soldiers get to live. Jesus knows if he runs that his disciples will be rounded up and executed. That's exactly what happened with other would-be messiahs and their followers. Jesus dies and his scared-to-death followers are saved. Jesus knows if he does say the word that the crowds will rise up and that Rome will come with a furious vengeance and will destroy them. And so Jesus dies in place of all of those who shouted and demanded his death. Whatever you think of Jesus, whether you believe that he is the divine son of God or not, he died and people were spared. Out of his remarkable brilliance, with breathtaking courage, motivated by an inexplicable love, Jesus died so that people could be saved. Who exactly would do something like that? And of all people, Pilate provides the answer. Pilate, who wasn't going to allow himself to be maneuvered by the Jewish priest, he ends up writing out in Aramaic the language of the people, in Greek, the language of the cultured world, and in Latin, the language of the Roman Empire, so that the whole world could read it and know, he writes the answer, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Jesus, he outfought, he outmaneuvered, he outwitted every other group, but he did more than that. He outloved everyone. Because in the garden, he had only one agenda. And his agenda was spurred by his love. And that love led him to the cross. It caused him to die. And so on Friday, he dies. He dies not because of Pilate or Herod or Caesar or the chief priest or the crowds of people. As Jesus told his disciples, I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. And so on Friday, the one true Messiah, in a world of wannabes, he lays down his life. On Friday, 
God declares his love for you and for me and every person who has ever lived. On Friday, in a garden, a decision is made and Jesus dies because Jesus loves you that much. And so the question we are left to answer is, do I love him? Do I love him in return? Reflect on him this next week. Reflect on what he did. Allow your thoughts to be filled with the wonder and the love for Jesus because of what he did for you on that one defining day. That's Friday. Jesus, I bow before you today in wonder and admiration at what you chose to do on that Friday. It helps me to appreciate what you did when I see all the historical factors, the the powers that were at play, what was taking place, and how in the midst of that, you refused to allow yourself to be maneuvered to a place where you didn't want to be, where you knew you couldn't be. But you steadfastly kept your eyes on the one goal that you had been given, to die as that sacrifice for sin, so that I could be forgiven and I could be set free eternally. It was about far more than being held slave to Roman occupiers. It was about releasing humanity from the sin that keeps us in bondage. Jesus, thank you for the deliverance that you provided by choosing to die for me. And so it is in your special holy name that we pray today, the name of Jesus, amen.